This video is going to um, talk about and demonstrate how we create a frequency polygon. Now, as we go through this, there's going to be some things that um, I kind of glaze over uh, because they're preliminary. So things like creating lower bounds, upper bounds, limits, class limits. Since we've been doing that for a while, uh, I'm going to make the assumption that we know how to do that. Uh, if not, please reference back to previous videos to uh, to pick up on that. Um, the idea with a frequency polygon is, one, you have to first construct a histogram. It's very similar to a histogram. Um, actually use the same characteristics as a histogram. So in fact, they're almost identical, except that frequency polygons can be used to compare sets of data or to display a cumulative frequency distribution. So in addition, histograms tend to be rectangles, while a frequency polygon resembles a line graph. So ultimately, um, they're going to provide us the same information just the display of them looks a little bit different. Um, and like I said, it's best used to compare two sets of data uh, that use the same sample size. Uh, you can kind of overlay the, the two graphs, then make, make comparisons that way. Um, but to create a frequency polygon, first thing you're going to need to do is create a histogram. So prior to creating a histogram, you need your frequency distribution. Um, this is the part of the frequency distribution that we've been working on with midpoints. Okay, we we need to be able to find the midpoint because that is the key point that we're going to graph um, for each um, each class on this uh, frequency polygon. So you'll place a point on the origin and at the end of the histogram. So what has to happen here is we're uh, actually going. It says origin. It's not necessarily going to be the origin. It basically means that when we look at our classes um, and we plot the information from our classes, we actually need to go one class prior to all of our data and then one class to the end of all of our data. Um, if working one class prior to our data gets us to the left of the, the y-axis, essentially, so the negative part of the x-axis, then we will just go straight down to the origin. Um, I'll, I'll make reference to that as we, as we construct our first one. Uh, so use the following data to construct a frequency polygon. So this is a uh, frequency distribution for calculus final test scores. Um, first thing uh, to kind of pay attention to here is that this is coming from, um, if I analyze this distribution, the cumulative frequency. Uh, so the last class is a frequency of 100, the cumulative frequency of 100. Uh, so that is quickly telling me my sample size. Um, and most likely, this is probably a population. Um, if I look at the frequency here, add these up, they should add to 100 as well. Um, so kind of talk about how we are going to construct this. We're going to first lay out our x and y axes like we have done for a histogram. So I'm going to pause this and fill that information in so I don't waste your time with my writing, uh, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Okay, so I've set up my x-axis in regards to the lower and upper bounds. Uh, you see here that we got 49.5 all the way up to 99.5. Uh, now, these two red ones that I added, those are extra. Okay, those are before my lower bound. Okay, and I want to keep the interval the same, so I'm going to subtract essentially 10 from there because um, that's the, the class width. Uh, that we're seeing between two uh, successive classes. Uh, and then my last one should be 109.5. Uh, there is no data at those positions, uh, but those are necessary for constructing the um, the frequency polygon, just the, the regular general convention that uh, is kind of agreed upon in statistics that, that we do that. Um, this is I'm doing a frequency polygon. The first question says use the following data to construct a frequency polygon. So um, we're using the frequency column, so that's why I put my y-axis here in terms of fives, um, and we're going to just do the, the relative frequency for um, each of these classes. Um, or I guess the frequency, not the relative frequency. Um, we could do relative frequency. It would just be as a percentage instead of the, um, the finite value here. Cumulative frequency uh, it asks us to do that eventually, so we'll go over the side and do that one as well. Um, now, we've got the x-axis set up this way. Uh, if I was doing a histogram, um, 
my histogram would look, you know, this first box here, or I'm gonna call that. Sometimes if you research, like how, like if you went how to read, how to construct a histogram or how to construct a um, frequency polygon, they're gonna call these bins. B I N. Um, doesn't really matter. You call it it's your class essentially. Um, so I did that, and then we'll make another one. Okay, and I'm just giving you just a, a reminder of how we create histograms and what the histograms are going to look like. Um, but I, it's going to be nice to be able to draw a comparison between a histogram and the uh, frequency polygon. Let's go to 30. And now we'll go, the next one was 40. And then we were at 15. All right, so that would be the histogram uh, if we were being asked to construct that. Okay. Um, if you remember the histogram, a couple of the examples that we did, we went ahead and we put the midpoints here. So I'm going to go through and do that for us. Okay, so if we put in our midpoints, um, obviously remember to find a midpoint um, of a particular class. You take the um, average of the limits or the average of the lower and upper bounds. Either one's going to give you the same position. Uh, so if I go 49.5 plus 59.5, um, that gives you 109, then divide that by 2, gives you 54.5. So 54.5 ends up being my first midpoint down here. Uh, and then, just like the class widths uh, and creating the, um, the boundaries or the class widths that we use to create the class limits, um, that distance is the same between midpoints. So instead of finding each one of these midpoints, then using the formula, I just since my class width here is 10, um, start at 54.5, add 10 to it, 64.5, add 10 to it, 74.5. Remove 10. For, this is the this is the one prior that we're going to need, and this is the one at the end uh, or post data that we need for our frequency polygon. But this would be the histogram. Now this is essentially what happens, and I'm going to cut and paste this uh, just for the convenience of not having to write all that out again, but if we were going to do a frequency polygon, so we've already got the histogram, so what happens with a frequency polygon is that instead of graphing these bends, okay, or these rectangles, what we do is we go to the midpoint of that bend, okay, or where that box would be for the histogram in that class, and we're going to put a point at the frequency. So the frequency for this one was 5. Put a point at that midpoint. Um, then we're going to do the same thing in the next box. And then the next box. The next box. And the next box. Okay, so we do that. Now the next thing that we would do, and I'm going to do this in blue, is that we would actually go 1 been previous where there was no data and we put a point at that midpoint uh, which is always going to be on the x-axis here and we do the same thing post data okay so we get those um, data points now if I was solely just interested in making the um, frequency polygon I would not incorporate the boxes now when I construct it, I like to have the boxes because it allows me to visually create those midpoints pretty easily. But that is essentially what we're getting for our frequency polygon. Uh, now all we have to do is connect them. So we will take our, or we use a straight line to do this. All right, so all I did is I went through and connected those with our straight lines. Now, remember, this information here was previous our data, 
this is post our data. So there's it should go down to a, a frequency of zero. Um, the general practice, and you can do this as, as you see fit. You know, we were use I, I use this entire x-axis, um, and I was very detailed putting my class boundaries and my midpoints. A lot of times, what you'll see on the x-axis and like a published um, frequency polygon is just the midpoint uh, tick marks. But uh, again, that's something that you can do um, at your free will. If you want to add extra information on the x-axis, I don't have an issue with that. Uh, one thing we should do is be um, very informative with labeling our x and y axes. So this was our frequency. Okay. And the um, bottom was the, with the calculus final scores. So calc final scores. And that's our frequency polygon. Okay. Um, what I want to do here real quick is just demonstrate that if we take our frequency polygon, it should be very similar to our histogram. Okay. So you can see they kind of they, they really give the same information to us. Um, but as stated before, if I've got two sets of data, maybe I've got a second class of 100 students taking this exam, um, a frequency polygon of data set one and a frequency polygon of data set two would allow me to make very quick, easy visual comparisons about those uh, pieces of data. Now, the next part says to do the same thing, but we're going to use this to create a cumulative frequency polygon. Okay, um, cumulative frequency polygons, you've, you've probably seen them. I, I know I've shown one in class for the, the CDC's website, so I'm going to pause and see if I can find that uh, website for us to, to kind of see a cumulative fre uh, frequency polygon. Okay, so here on the Ohio Department of Health website, uh, we've got the ability to look at the different graphs and statistics of uh, the coronavirus, the different metrics that they have. Um, if we come up here uh, and talk about the cumulative and daily count, so uh, you can kind of you can argue that this would be. Um, see if I can zoom in on it a little bit better. It's not really a great um, visual they give you, and not being able to expand this. Uh, but this is ultimately a histogram. Okay, it's giving you the the days across the bottom, uh, and then the size of the. Um, bar is telling you essentially the frequency. Now, what I think is maybe somewhat misleading here um, is that we don't have a y-axis, uh, so it allows me to, um, that it's just hard to compare. Now, you can obviously move around. You can see that it changes the date and then it gives you the actual frequency of that date. Um, but we can change it to cumulative. And basically, so this is, I, I would still argue this is a histogram. Um, because there's still rectangles that we're using here, um, but it's now just talking about the cumulative frequency. Um, so right there uh, is you know 45,293 cumulative cases, and that's from the onset date of 6:15. Um, so um, if but it's cumulative, so right here is going to be all of the cases so far since this started. Okay, so you see there, um, 10.5, which was yesterday. Um, now, if we were to just take the essentially the midpoints of these days uh, and connect them with a line, we would get our cumulative frequency polygon. So the cumulative frequency polygon is going to look kind of like the ridge of this graph, okay, um, and they're always going to finish at 100% um, or um, if you're doing it in regards to um, the frequency, so if it was relative frequency, 
um, like we've seen with let's see here like this here uh, where we put it in uh, decimal from zero to one it's always going to finish the last point is going to be at a height of one um, if we're out of a hundred we're doing this with the the, the actual finite quantity uh, of frequency, then we're going to reach our, our, our last point will be up at 100 for this case, or how many pieces of data you have. So I'm going to just structure real quick the um, x and y axis for this, and then we'll, we'll pick up from there. Okay, so setting up a cumulative uh, frequency polygon, and I'm going to give you a different name for this. Um, okay, same thing as a frequency, sorry, cumulative frequency polygon. And this is pronounced ogive, okay, ogive. Um, the the structure of these um your x axis is going to be labeled with the upper um boundaries okay upper boundaries uh and i'm also going to have to we're going to have obviously the the first lower bound as well um so that's going to essentially be our starting point um at that stage, though, we have a zero cumulative frequency so far because there's no data um, below 49.5. Um, sometimes, so, so right in the all the stat textbooks that I've ever been part of, um, whether as a student taking a class or a teacher teaching it, um, the textbooks will usually uh, talk about using your upper boundaries. Um, if we're in um, like Math Excel and they just use, like they give you a picture um, and they're using upper limits, that's okay as well. That's another thing that can be flexible from time to time is that they, they might, you might see publications that use down here the upper limits of each class instead of the boundaries. Um, but the I, I would say the vast majority of text will say use the upper boundaries. <clears throat> Next thing you do, so the, the y-axis, then you just need to make sure that your y-axis is labeled um, sufficiently so that you can get to uh, your cumulative. Because what's going to happen essentially is it's going to be a running total, running tally. And in this last class, once you've reached your last upper bound, there's no data to the right of that. So it's going to be your highest value, which is going to be the number of samples you have, uh, or number of data points you have in your sample. So, just kind of get at doing this real quick, plotting these points. Um, I'm going to first, you know, in this first class, my upper bound was 59.5 and a frequency of 5. So, I'm going to go to 59.5 and I'm going to find the height of 5. <clears throat> so, then when I'm in this next bound, uh, boundary or class, the number of data points that are in that or below it turns to be 15. So I'm going to come up to 69.5 and we'll go find a height of 15, which is maybe about right there. 79.5 then is all the way up to 45. So let's try to keep this as accurate as possible, about right there. Uh, next one is 89.5, and it's going to be up to 85. And then the last one, 99.5, is all the way at 100. And now, obviously, our starting point would have been in this lowest bound. Uh, so now all we have to do is connect these dots then with our segments. So once we connect them with uh, our straight lines, we get our cumulative frequency polygon. Again, key characteristic, it should finish at the um, size of your sample. Okay, so we had 100, 
Um, so we should finish at the total. Um, the beginning, this should always be, this first mark should be the lower bound of your first class. Uh, and then everything else is the upper bound because it's cumulative. So you want to be able to make sure that at the end of the first um, bin or class, we have the running total essentially of how many pieces of data we've we've analyzed from that point backwards. So at 69.5 here, um, that's this, the upper bound of the second bin or second class. So then the 15 shows us all of the data prior, so it's all of this information. Um, you've heard me talk about a Pareto chart um, before. A Pareto chart, uh, I've explained it as, it's essentially a histogram where like it's in um, like greatest to least uh, in regards to um, the data uh, along the x-axis okay so basically hits your but or reorganize it um, so our data shows greatest to least uh, a lot of times what you'll see if you were to google you know a Pareto chart is that they're going to actually superimpose on top of it a um, cumulative frequency polygon as well okay so you'll see both those things as a Pareto chart um, I'm not going to get right now in, in much more detail about Pareto charts um, until that becomes necessary later on. Um, these two, so use the following sets of data to compute frequency polygons of both sets of data. Uh, these are for your um, extra practice uh, if you need extra practice. Um, I'll quickly uh, generate what one of these looks like uh, and then you can see if what you've done models those or not. Okay, so in constructing these um, frequency uh, polygons, this first set of data is actually the example we've already done up here. Um, so that's, you know, I say I have class number one uh, that has 100 people in it. So I have class number two also has 100 people in it, same sample size, and that's the key here. If you want to compare two uh, samples with um, relative or sorry, um, frequency polygons, it makes sense to have the same uh, size sample. Um, but what's nice about these um, is that we can now, once we have them both, we can make visual comparisons. Um, notice this first one here, um, or I guess not for a second, second one here. Um, again, the starting point is 44.5. That's the class prior to 49.5, uh, or the midpoint prior to that. And this 104.5 is the midpoint uh, post all of my data. Uh, and in this one, we have a frequency height of 45 is the maximum. Um, but it's it's nice to be able to now have uh, the visual comparison here. It looks to me, uh, and we can make uh, our arguments. You know, it looks to me that a bulk of our data is kind of in the same re region, you know, 64.5 to 94.5, uh, as it is over here. Okay. Um, we can talk eventually once we get further into the course. Is this more of a like a normal distribution, that kind of stuff? Um, what's also kind of beneficial is that we can overlay these, and you can then see. Uh, maybe more drastic or how similar the two things are uh, by doing something like that okay um, the next type of, of graph that we want to talk about is what we call a time series graph these are not very difficult or nor time consuming to create um, a time series graph is a line graph of repeated measurements taken over regular time intervals so time is always shown on the horizontal axis on a time series graph data the points are drawn at regular intervals and the points joined usually with straight lines the time series graphs help to show trends or patterns um, so here it says construct a time series graph using the data above that shows the sales of a company and says in millions of dollars uh, from 1986 to 2000. okay so i've set up my um, x-axis here uh, and because obviously 
you know, going from year zero to 1986, there's a uh, lot more space here that should have. So we break, we can break a graph horizontally as well as we can break it vertically. Um, so obviously the gap there between those two successive years is different than those two. Um, uh, you can see certain things. Um, you might see some, you know, I labeled here 1986. Um, some people will write this as like year one, year two, year three, year four. Uh, it'll go all the way through, and then they'll have a key that tells you, you know, 1986 was the first year or something like that. So you can um, maybe do some work that way. Um, a lot of times series graphs will have these horizontal lines as well. Um, that is strictly a visual thing to help us. Um, align things a little bit better when we're plotting these points. So when I plot this point 1986, comma 12, uh, it's just going to be about right there. Uh, 1987, comma 3, going to be maybe about right there. Uh, 88, 9, 89 is up to 24. Uh, and obviously, then you know I can. If, if I were to zoom in, maybe, so we've got these intervals of five here. Um, I could put other horizontal lines in there as, and get as maybe precise as, as I want with this. Um, but there's no like, set rule on your precision. So 91 was 48. So this is, I mean, how you guys... I've always learned how to, to make a bar, or not a bar, a line graph. Uh, so 1992 is up to 27, back down to 27. 93 is at 15. 99. Or sorry, that's a 4. 94 is 36. So once we have all our data points plotted, uh, then we'll go through and connect them with our straight lines. Um, so I'll do that. So connecting those with um, straight lines, we can start to see then that it's it's kind of easy to see trends. You know, from 87 to 91, this company uh, obviously was increasing in their sales, um, and these were again per million. Um, something nice about line graphs like this or time series graphs is you can, uh, you know, if you look at your stocks or if you invest in stocks at some point in your life, um, the trends of particular stocks uh, that you own, uh, you can kind of see, you know, are they on the rise? Are they falling? What has been their um, their behavior in the past? And then what's nice also is that you can kind of see how um, certain stocks uh, or just even these sales, you can see how um, they are maybe impacted by other uh, external uh, events. Okay, so you know if I'm going from 91 to 93, what if I compare this to what was happening in 91 to 93 in the real world? What what may have been an influence on this? Okay, um, was there um, maybe a, a mini recession in those those years, and that's why sales went down? Um, we can look at maybe there was a you know, a housing crisis or something like that, and maybe that's why certain stocks go down. Um, so we can we can do that. We like to do that, uh, taking a time series graph and then trying to analyze in the the causality between external forces and um, the data that's being displayed. But again, that's not uh, an excessive um, amount of work to create a time series graph, and uh, to be honest with you, it's not something that should be new to you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to actually, just to, to save a little bit of time for you, I'm going to skip this example. Um, basically, all you're going to do, time series graph, x-axis is going to be your your weeks, okay, week 1 through 20. Uh, and then your y-axis is going to be your distances. Now, you be, be intelligent about how you do this. What I would do is um, maybe on my sense I'm going from 1.4, looks like the smallest value. So I might go from, I, 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 my y-axis is going to be, want to have a lot of space in here, um, even though that the data points of 1.4 and the maximum is 2.7, uh, 
um, I'm going to kind of zoom in on that y-axis and make that um, nice enough so I can I can be legible and read it. Okay, um, just to kind of wrap things up for this section. It says how to decide which type of graph to use. Okay, bar graphs. I'll let you read this. Um, this again this is part of your notes, um, but these are all uh, the types of graphs that we've talked about so far. Um, As we progress through uh, the course, just because we're done with you know histograms in 2.2 or 2.1, uh, doesn't mean that if 2.2 histograms are going to be never talked about again. They're going to be things that uh, reappear. All of these graphs are going to be things that reappear uh, on a regular basis. Okay. Now we didn't talk about um, circle graphs yet, pie charts. Um, we might do that in the future. Uh, but again, that's something that you've probably spent uh, a bulk amount of time in uh, previous courses, especially maybe 7th and 8th grade, on teaching uh, how to construct a, a pie graph. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out, um, and I'll be in contact with you about um, assignments um, that should couple with this video.